Some served under a Republican president, some under a Democrat, some under both, and some in uniform. They don't agree on everything, but together they represent a great deal of expertise, experiences, and lessons learned. I asked them to join me for a candid conversation about some of the most challenging issues facing our country, because I believe that America's national security must be the top priority for our next president. To do that job, you need to constantly seek new information and new perspectives, test your assumptions, ask and answer hard questions. That's what today was about, and I'm grateful to these men and women for sharing their insights with me. I hope and intend that our conversations will continue because, as I've said many times, I believe in a bipartisan foreign policy. We won't always see eye to eye, but when it comes to questions of war, peace, and the safety of our country, we can't let party affiliation stand between us. We need to put partisanship aside and work together for the good of all of us. And I know we can do it. I've seen it happen under both Republican and Democratic presidents. So that will be my goal if I'm elected this fall. Today our main conversation was, as you might expect, ISIS and other terrorist threats. We discussed how ISIS is finding ways to convince young men around the world and some young women, including in our own country, to get assault weapons or strap on bombs and kill large numbers of people. And we talked specifically about a strategy to protect us from that threat here at home. We went into detail on what it will take to surge our intelligence to help us detect and prevent attacks before they happen. We also discussed methods to disrupt online recruitment so they stop reaching and radicalizing young people on the internet. And one of the points that many of the participants emphasized, which deserves a higher priority in a counterterrorism strategy, is the role of local governments and community leaders here at home who truly do act as our first line of defense. While we protect the homeland, though, we need to take the fight to ISIS. That means smashing their strongholds, denying them safe havens, dismantling the global network of fighters, financing, and arms that supply these terrorists, which requires working closely with our allies. It does not mean sending contingents of American combat troops to take and hold territory. That's neither wise nor in the interest of the United States, and it is exactly what ISIS wants. Instead, we have to hit them from the air and intensify support for local Arab and Kurdish partners on the ground. I support deploying more special forces, enablers, and trainers as needed, increased surveillance, intelligence gathering, and reconnaissance. And as I said earlier this week, I also believe it should be a top priority to take the leader of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, off the battlefield, just like we did with Osama bin Laden. That will help us focus our efforts and make it very clear that no one attacks the United States or inspires attacks without being brought to justice. Here today, we talked about what we need to do. I would stand up a mission team to bring focus and priority to this effort. We will devote the intelligence assets necessary combined with the capabilities of our allies and partners on the ground and the precise application of military force. We know how to do this. We have models to draw from. It will be a paramount priority for me as president, and it will send exactly the right message. History tells us that we need an approach that's comprehensive and deals with multiple overlapping conflicts in the region and along the entire arc of instability from North Africa through the Middle East into Central Asia and beyond. As we've been reminded in just the last 24 hours with reports of another nuclear test in North Korea, we face threats from many parts of the world. Indeed, ISIS and North Korea's quest for a nuclear weapon are not entirely unconnected because the greatest threat of all would be terrorists getting their hands 
on loose nuclear material. So it's vital we bring the world together to stop North Korea's dangerous game. In discussions of national security, it can be easy to get mired in the tactics or overly focused on the threats. But let's not lose sight of what this, this larger project of American leadership is all about. It is about creating more peace in our world, more prosperity, more human dignity. And that's what we have to also be focused on every day. There were a number of very excellent suggestions about what we can and should be doing here at home to try to bring our American Muslim community much more closely and welcomed into the struggle against radicalization and recruitment. Uh, and I am anxious to follow up on the ideas and even some of the model programs uh, that are currently uh, underway. I'm humbled to be supported in this race by a growing number of retired military leaders. Earlier this week, 95 retired generals and admirals endorsed me for president. And in the past 48 hours, another 15 have joined them. So have people on both sides of the debates that have defined our foreign policy for the last 30 years. Their support is an honor. I'm grateful for it, but it's also a signal that this election is different. I don't want to rehash everything my opponent has said in this campaign, but no conversation about our national security would be complete unless we acknowledge that the nominee on the other side promises to do things that will make us less safe. National security experts on both sides of the aisle are chilled by what they're hearing from the Republican nominee. That may be the number one reason why this election is the most important in our lifetimes. So I'm not waiting until November. I'm bringing Democrats and Republicans together now because I plan to get right down to work on day one. The stakes are too high and the issues too serious for anything less than that level of preparedness. Americans should be able to count on their president and commander in chief to provide rational, confident, and even keeled leadership, especially in tumultuous times like these. So I'm very grateful to the men and women I met with today, experts with a broad range of understanding and willingness to share their insights. And I look forward to continuing to receive their advice in the days and weeks ahead. So we'll take just one or two questions. Well, Amy, I think it's clear that the uh, increasing threat uh, posed by North Korea requires not only a rethinking of the strategy, but an urgent uh, effort to uh, convince the neighbors, most particularly China, that this is not just a U.S. Uh, issue. And I think we have an opening here that we haven't had. Uh, for the last several years that I intend uh, to do everything I can uh, to take advantage of. Uh, but we're also going to support and equip our allies in the region uh, with the missile defense systems that they require to protect themselves. Uh, that is not something that uh, either the North Koreans or the Chinese or the Russians in the region are particularly uh, pleased about, but what is the alternative? We are not going to let anyone who is a treaty ally and partner of ours, be threatened. And we are not going to let North Korea pursue a nuclear weapon with the ballistic missile capacity to deliver it to uh, the United States territory. That is absolutely a bottom line. And if other countries want to uh, assist us in this effort, we welcome that. And we will engage in intensive uh, discussions as soon as uh, possible. earlier today saying that you support 
President Obama's call for additional sanctions on North Korea, but they've faced sanctions for years, and clearly it hasn't stopped them from moving forward on their nuclear program. So how will a few more sanctions help, and would you consider the kinds of negotiations that you pushed for with Iran? Well, the answer to the second question is yes, because we faced a similar uh, problem um, in 2009. Uh, as a senator, I voted for every sanction that was put before the Senate against Iran in our effort to try to prevent Iran from moving forward on a nuclear program. It didn't stop them. They built covert facilities. They mastered the nuclear fuel cycle. They were able to acquire and put into operation uh, a significant number of centrifuges. So our sanctions, despite our best efforts, were not enough. And although we have international sanctions against North Korea, some of which I helped to negotiate when I was there, uh, they aren't enough either. And they aren't enough for the very same reason I was responding to Amy about. They're not enough because China has not yet made the decision that it needs to make, that North Korea poses a threat to the region and poses a threat to the kind of stable border relationship that China has always valued with North Korea. So we are going to continue to look at how we tighten sanctions, because I do think there is a role for sanctions. The regime in North Korea lives off of uh, goods and material that can be smuggled in uh, to keep their lifestyle and their uh, love of luxury going. So I think there's a lot more we can do. And it will be on the top of my list in dealing uh, with China on uh, how we're going to prevent what could very well be a serious uh, conflict uh, with North Korea. Well, Jennifer, you know, you don't talk about leverage until you actually produce leverage. And I, I believe that we do have leverage with China, and I believe, based on my extensive discussions when I was Secretary of State, uh, that there's even a conversation starting within China about how to handle the uh, changes in the North Korean regime. Uh, China has no interest in seeing uh, the kind of buildup which we are going to be doing. And I, I will stress this and underline it we will not leave our friends and allies unprotected. And we will do everything we can to put in the most effective missile defense system against anything that North Korea does. Chinese are not happy about that. We have a lot of leverage. And we're going to exercise that leverage. And we're going to put together the kind of uh, negotiations that I think can lead uh, to a beginning uh, of containing and controlling the behavior of the North Korean government, which has the danger of affecting everyone, including China. Thank, thank you all. Thank you all. Secretary Clinton, do you have a response to Donald Trump appearing on Russian-funded television? <laughs> you know, every day that goes by, this just becomes more and more of a reality television story. Uh, show. It's not, it, it's not a serious presidential campaign. And it is beyond one's imagination to have a candidate for president praising a Russian autocrat like Vladimir Putin and throwing his lot in with him in the way that he has uh, approved of his uh, wish list and not even really understanding what Putin has already done, like invading and occupying Crimea. We are living in challenging times, and that certainly was reinforced by the excellent discussion we had today. No one who wants to assume the responsibility of being president and commander in chief should be making the kind of uh, reckless and dangerous statements and identifying with uh, a regime uh, that has uh, some aggressive tendencies toward 
uh, our interests, our values, our friends and allies. Um, so can I say I was surprised? I'm not sure anything surprises us anymore, but I was certainly disappointed that someone running for President of the United States would uh, continue this um, unseemly uh, identification with and praise of uh, the Russian president, including on Russian television. Thank you all.